Let's praise him this morning. Welcome. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you I was breathing But not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you This new year, we cry out to you, the one who restores broken hearts, who refreshes tired spirits, who makes all things new. Let our faith and hope be born again today. Help us to let go of the past, stop looking back and Turn our eyes toward you. We are here today in full acceptance of who we've been, but also in hopeful expectation of who you're shaping us to be. Let your love work in us 
so you can better work through us. We stand ready, ready to embrace all you have for our lives, ready to do your will, ready to witness the wonders of your mighty hand, ready to share the redeeming love, the perfect grace, the life-changing salvation you have given us. So today, we lift up our voices in praise to the one who washes away our failures, who wipes away our fear and doubt, to the almighty God who makes all things new. The 
Well, good morning and happy new year. You have made it to 2023 and I am so grateful to share this Sunday morning together with you. Everyone from our new Kensington campus, everyone from our Franklin Park campus, everyone everywhere who's joining in, thank you so much. Uh, yes, today you will notice I'm wearing my Steeler jersey because the Steelers are playing tonight. Their game has been flexed from a 1 p.m. game to an 8 p.m. prime time game. So as a famous Steeler quote after winning the Super Bowl in 2005 went, who's laughing now, O-line? Because so many were laughing at the Steelers when they were apparently out of it and their game got flexed from the night game to a day game. They're back in prime time. <laughs> okay, enough gloating. Uh, hey, I wanted to uh, let you know that we are experiencing a magnificent temperature shift here in New Kensington. Maybe you are where you experiencing the same kind of shift where you are as well. We're filming this on Friday afternoon, which a week ago, the temperature, according to my car and on the news, was negative 5 degrees. <laughs> and today, now, a high of 61. How about that? 66 degree shift in a one week period of time. There you go. I thought about filming in my shorts today, but nobody in December or January really needs to see these legs. So, actually nobody at any time ever needs to see these legs. Um, we are filming today outside uh, a, a place that made quite an impact in my life. Uh, 32 years ago, when I met my wife in December, in March of 1991, I was introduced shortly after that to these enormous chicken wings, and these wings changed my life. I've always liked wing dings, but I never had full-size jumbo, all put together deep fried chick breaded and deep fried chicken wings until I had Gunny's wings 
for the very first time. Now, I'm new to New Ken, which means I came to New Ken 32 years ago. Yes, if you're in New Kensington uh, and came here sometime other than when you were born here, you still can claim to be new to New Kensington. <laughs> so they were new to me. People that have been here their whole lives have said, oh, well, those are just like Funzie's wings or the wings you get at Braha or where, you know, all these different restaurants now uh, have great, amazing, enormous, huge wings. Now, if you like your wings, uh, flame broiled, if you like them uh, baked, then go to Buffalo Bills, uh, another favorite wing place here in New Kensington. So we wanted to film outside today, didn't have anywhere lined up on January 1st, so thought I would introduce you to my favorite uh, wing place, my introduction to wings here in New Kensington. Now you may notice the for sale sign, the available sign. I just want to let you know, just like the river, here there's a for sale sign in on the street but they're still open so same as the river so just want to let you know the river is still open even though our building that we do not own is for sale all right you ready to jump into things here we go oh and let me show you one other thing uh, my daughter was making a christmas gift for her boyfriend's uh uh she was making him a sweatshirt with his fraternity Greek letters on, sewed on, stitched on to his sweater, sweatshirt. And she needed a pattern for his letters. So she used our home printer. So when I printed my sermon notes today, this is what came out. So if halfway through my message, I start speaking in Greek, I hope you'll understand why. And I wore my glasses, have them available just in case I need to read through the translucent letters a little bit. Oh my. So, this is a new year. I love when new years begin because they are marked and remarkable times and an opportunity to focus, to adjust, to hope, to dream, to envision, to recalibrate in a word their opportunities to change. Now actually, we have this opportunity every moment and every day. Especially, this gift is available to us every day that we awake with air, our, with air in our lungs on this side of eternity. But today, the entire world is considering what do I want 2023 to look like? Okay, maybe not people that are on different calendars than us, but our entire world <laughs> that observes our calendar are asking that question. What do I want 2023 to look like, to be like? How do I want it to be different? Uh, some may say, hey, I, I want to give attention to my physical well-being, to exercising, to eating differently. Uh, this week I was somewhere in a suit and a friend saw me and they said, wow, you look really, and then she kind of paused like she was looking for the words and said, healthy. <laughs> now I love my Italian friends. Their, their thought is the heavier, the healthier, because I've been eating way more than I should over this holiday season. And so I was quite amused. I'm like, well, I don't really think that's the first word that came to your mind. But many of us, we give attention in this new year to our physical well-being. Others choose to give attention to our relationships with God and with others. Others, we take a special look at our finances during this time or the projects that we want to accomplish this year. Possibly our career. In short, we look at our future. I just want to say how we approach next year, this year, 2023, how we approach this year, it matters. 
It matters. Are we stuck in fear? Are we playing the old memories and life experiences in our mind, expecting nothing to be different, better, or new? This is something that I'm very um, convicted by, that I feel very strongly about. And so if my passion for this feels a little overwhelming, or if you're listening to this and, and think, wow, Pastor Dean, he's going all Joel Olstein on us. It's all about positive thinking and this and that. I, I, just, I just want you to invite you to give me an umbrella of grace today as I just express some very personal, important things that I have noticed in my life that I want to share with you. The way, the reality is we have a say in what 2023 looks like for us. If we head into this world, year expecting the worst looking for the bad convinced that nothing good is going to happen guess what's going to show up now to my um, embarrassment 10 years ago i did this <laughs> i said oh i'm really afraid of what 2013 might bring me <laughs> i'm never doing that again I cannot wait to see what the Lord has in store for me and for you in 2023. Now, this message, it's going to be a little long on the front end before we get to the video. So I want to invite you to just hang in with me, okay? The way we handle everything that comes our way in 2023 it's up to us. I love this quote, and it may be phrased a little differently than you've heard it. I've heard it different ways at different times. This is kind of my wording with it, but it's a quote that goes something like this. It matters what happens to us, but matters, it matters ultimately more how we respond to what happens to us. There are things that happen to us that we have no control over. We can't control everything that comes our way. However, how we respond to everything that comes our ways is what ultimately makes the difference. We influence more than we know. We influence more than we know how we navigate what comes our way. So today, uh, we're gonna take just a few minutes and look at two heroes in the faith. Two people that I'm like, I, I wanna be like them. Uh, the first one is just simply Caleb. Caleb was Joshua's best buddy and was a great leader in Israel and was commissioned by God to go into the land of Canaan as a spy and bring back a report to the people of this land that God was going to give them. And he and Joshua came back and they saw the possibilities and they chose to trust in God and they say, let's go, it's gonna be great. But the other 10 spies went in. They chose to focus on the obstacles. They chose to look at all the things that could keep this from happening and from occurring and get in the way of God's plan. And so they came back with a very fearful report. And they spread fear throughout all of Israel so that the entire nation revolted and said, we're not going in. And God said, okay, I'll honor that. Because you refused to go in when I called you to go in, you will never go in. And Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, they got to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until all of those adults died off, except for Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> they were 40 years old then. 
So we're going to pick the story up at the end of that time when they're entering the land and conquering the land. And Joshua is about to commission what tribes of Israel are to go where and what lands they are to inhabit. And in Joshua chapter 14, verses 6 through 14, it has the account of Caleb's attitude now. In verse 10, he says, Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. So this is 45 years after he first went into Canaan and brought back a good report to go in and conquer this land. So how old would that make him? Well, if you're not very good at math, I hope you're good at reading because the Bible tells us. He says, Kept me alive for 45 years while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. So I try to envision what might Caleb look like physically at this time, and images of an older Jack LaLanne come to mind. You know, the fitness guy that uh, was from the 50s and 60s and lived to be, I think, well into his 90s. Uh, That's the image that comes to mind. Now, verse 12, listen to this declaration by this 85-year-old Caleb. He says, now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, (laughs) but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb and gave him Hebron, as in his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb ever since because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. And it not, did not just belong to Caleb, but it belonged to Caleb and his descendants. Caleb's resolve and determination to look at the possibilities, to hold on to the promises of God in spite of all the reasons he shouldn't. The dude's 85 years old, and yet he still lived with this tenacity, this determination, this resolve. And he believed and trusted the Lord. I want to live like Caleb lived. I want to have that kind of resolve. I want to face this new year as a 56-year-old man with as much hope and optimism and resolve to trust and believe as Caleb did. So he's my first hero in the faith I want to focus on. The second one is just simply Jeremiah. Jeremiah had an anointed beginning. Listen to verses 4 through 9 of Jeremiah 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before, this is God talking to Jeremiah now, saying to him, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, Sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go everywhere I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Now, we may read that calling of Jeremiah and say, man, I want to be him. (laughs) But even though God's hand and calling and anointing and power was on Jeremiah, guess what? The fruits of his effort did not turn out the way Jeremiah wanted them to. Jeremiah's life and ministry was one primarily of struggle, angst, pain, failure, and he loved God. He followed God. He did what God called him to do. 
And so I just want to say, if your life has not turned out the way you wanted it to, and you feel like it has been marked by discouragement and angst and pain, and and you feel defeated, I, I want Jeremiah's experience I want you to find comfort and resolve here. Because to be honest with you, the, the years that Jeremiah and his journey, to me, I so identified them for my first five years in ministry before we moved here. I remember identifying with Jeremiah so closely, being discouraged and overwhelmed and beat down and defeated but choosing to remain faithful. Just a little glimpse into Jeremiah's calling. He set out and did exactly what the Lord said, but in Jeremiah 11 verse 18, his listeners to his message, they plotted to kill him. In chapter 20 verse 2, they put him in stocks. No, I'm not saying they put him in socks. They put him in stocks. Speaking of socks, I'd like to show you my Christmas socks that I got from my brother-in-law. I'm going to try to lift my leg up and stand on one foot. They have the Christian fish symbol here. I'll try to do it better. Christian fish symbol and the cross. So my brother-in-law bought each of us themed style socks. I got the Jesus fish and the cross on mine. I'm so thrilled and I'm wearing them today. But Jeremiah, he was not wearing new socks. He was locked up in stocks. Chapter 36, the king, he puts an arrest warrant out on Jeremiah. This is not going how Jeremiah had hoped. Chapter 37, he was put in a dungeon, then chained in the courtyard of the guard. Verse 38, probably at his lowest point, he was lowered down into a muddy cistern, a well that was filled with mud, and he sank in the mud. And yet, at two distinct times in this book, in his life, God came back to him and said, hey, will you follow my command? Will you do what I say? And Jeremiah's response is, I will trust you once again. And Jeremiah did not have success as we would think. He was trying to warn the children of Israel to turn back to God or they would be carried away. They would be taken into captivity. So I want to help you. If you find yourself there, just a couple things that Jeremiah did that we can do. First of all, take your complaints to God. His shoulders are big enough for your rage, for your angst, for your complaints. I love the way Jeremiah in chapter 20, verse 7 says this. Listen to what he accuses God of. He says, oh Lord, you deceived me. (laughs) God's shoulders were big enough for that. But instead, we often take our complaints to everyone else, to social media. We take our complaints there. But Jeremiah, he took his complaints to God. Secondly, he renewed his confidence in God. In Jeremiah 20, 11, it says, the Lord is with me. Even after he complained in verse 7, he said in verse 11, the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. And then I love this one. He worshiped during these times. Chapter 20, verse 13, just two verses later. He says, sing to the Lord, give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. I want to invite you to enjoy this video. And this video is just simply called A Declaration of a New Year. Now, this video may push on your theology a little bit. It may make you a little uncomfortable, and that's okay. I want to invite you to sit with that. But I want to invite you to imagine this and living with this type of declaration for your 2023.
Sometimes it's not enough to be reminded that Jesus hasn't left you or forgotten you. We need to declare it over ourselves, over others. No matter the season you may find yourself in, no matter the depths of darkness you're wading through, you can join him in declaring the truth that God is light upon your feet, whether or not you can see the next step, that God is your strength, even though the weight of life seems to be crushing you down. And that when your job, your marriage, your relationship, your health feels like it's coming to a dead end, there is only one God that can make dead things live again. These are his promises and they're the only thing you need to declare over your life. So as you step into this next season or this next moment, you can declare that God's not done with you. He's just getting started. You can declare that the good work that he has started in you, he will surely complete it. You can declare that the same God that parted the seas goes before you, goes behind you. You can declare these promises over your life, over your family's life, over the people passing on the street. You can declare these truths over every circumstance, over every season of your life. You can declare that that every day belongs to him and every new breath belongs to him. Because we have the power of a living God living inside of us. And this is our declaration. Well, I wanted to wrap up this New Year's Day sermon in front of another iconic eatery in New Kensington. Now, this is Rose's Bakery and Pizza Shop. And if you know anybody that has ever lived in New Kensington, they will talk so fondly about this pizza that you'll, you'll think, I've never heard somebody go on and on about how amazing pizza is. This pizza means so much to so many pe people. One of my friends and parishioners had this pizza served at their rehearsal dinner. That's how much she loved and they, the husband and wife, love this pizza. Now, my brother-in-laws, when they come in from out of state, they have to get a Rose's pizza because it just means the world to them. If you talk to Mayor Tom Guzzo, he will say, you know, when you were a kid, you used to get out of school at lunchtime at Edgewood School, and we would walk down to Rose's, and for 50 cents, we could buy two slices of pie, two slices of pizza pie, and a soft drink for 50 cents. So if you ever want some nostalgia, just talk to anybody about Rose's Pizza and the impact it made on their life especially if they're from New Kensington. <laughs> so, all that aside, uh, we've looked at Caleb and his resolve to face a daunting challenge. Make no mistake, driving out the people that were in this land that God had called them to drive out was not going to be a simple ta task, and yet he was resolved and determined to do that. Or whether your call on your life feels a little bit more like Jeremiah, where it's been harder than you thought it would be, harder than you sh thought it should be, more difficult than you ever imagined. I, I want to invite you to follow and do what Jeremiah did in the midst of that pain. I honestly have lived at times in my life with both. The great exuberance of moving forward with great positiveness and energy, and yet times when it's been so discouraging and hard, I've just wanted to quit. And so I 
want to share with you a few of my declarations. You watch that video about these declarations. I, I want to share with you a few declarations that are very important to me. So let's go. I choose optimism and joy. It's a choice I have and I choose to live with optimism and joy. And this is a choice that I get to make every day. I can choose to see the potential, choose to see the possibility, choose to see the gift that a situation is. Part of why I do that is found in this scripture, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. And make no mistake about it. I'll get to Jeremiah again in a second. But Nehemiah is talking to those who were in exile and went back to the destroyed Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And they got back there and they were discouraged and they were overwhelmed and they were brokenhearted. And Nehemiah wanted them to experience the power of optimism and joy. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. He's letting them know, even in the midst of the, their discouragement, I want you to live with joy. And then he says, he makes a declaration. He says, this is, this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when we're discouraged and overwhelmed, I want to invite us to move toward optimism and joy because the joy of the Lord, when we are leaning into trusting the Lord, we find joy in Him. It gives us strength. A second declaration that I live with is I choose tenacity. I choose resolve. I choose grit and determination. I choose action. I choose to move forward. This is my declaration for 2023. I love the way Paul cautions a young minister against the exact opposite. He says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, and this is in the King James Version, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I choose tenacity. I choose action. I choose not to cower in fear. I choose to move forward in 2023. Uh, perhaps... You were at our gathering at the church a few weeks back on a Sunday evening when nearly 50 of us gathered together to process through the reality of our building being for sale. And we were exploring potential possibilities and, and somebody said to me, how does all of this land on you? And I said very quickly, I'm terrified. Because <laughs> I'm being honest. But the truth is, I am not letting that stop me. I am not living in fear. I am living with tenacity, resolve, and determination to take action and move forward. So bring it on. I choose tenacity. My third resolution that I live with, my third declaration, is I choose kindness and to be helpful. Now, if you're saying your grammar is correct, you would say I choose to be kind and choose to be helpful, or I choose kindness and I choose helpfulness. But I, I choose kindness and to be helpful. 
I, I lean into Paul's words in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You're like, well, Dean, it doesn't say anything about being helpful there. Yeah, but listen to this next phrase. If you do all those things, that will be helpful, by the way. Would it be helpful if everybody was just a little more kind? (laughs) Would that be helpful? (laughs) But then verse 13 just begins with this statement. Bear with each other. Bear with each other. Come alongside and help bear. Be helpful. Help carry the load. Uh, This is a theme in our family that I've tried to teach our children from a very early age. And yesterday, going car shopping with my daughter, uh, she asked me, Dad, have have you always been this helpful? And I'm like, no, I I learned it. He goes, well, how did you learn it? And I said, well, granddaddy was this helpful. My granny was this helpful. My dad was this helpful. I said, "I I didn't know that it was important to be helpful. I thought it was all about being helped. (laughs) So I loved being helped by them. And I was too young and immature to see the importance of being helpful to everyone else. So I'm so grateful for this declaration, this resolve, this determination to be kind and to be helpful. And finally, the last resolution I have, the last declaration I have, is even when things seem at their darkest, I choose to believe God knows best and has my best interest at heart. I do. You know my favorite scripture. I refer to it regularly, almost weekly, Jeremiah 29, 11. What you may not know is the setting that this declaration is being spoken in by the Lord. It's in Jeremiah chapter 29 at the end, near the end of his book, and Jeremiah faithfully carried out his calling, and yet the fruit was not there. The people did not turn back to God, so they were carried away in exile. And even when they were in exile, taken from their land, living in a foreign land, God comes to them and says, even though things look dark and dismal, even though this is not where you want to be, even though you feel abandoned, even though you're very discouraged, God makes this declaration and asks Jeremiah to pass it on to his people. He says, God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Perhaps you know the story of Job, the one who hit darkness and tragedy and catastrophe stronger than any of us ever have. I love this one verse he declares in chapter 13, verse 15 of his book, again in the King James. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So this sermon is the first one I've ever preached that I let you know what the sermon title is at the end of the sermon instead of the beginning. Oh, I've alluded to it. I've said the sermon title at the end before when I've forgotten it, but today I have it intentionally planned to declare the sermon of this message at the end of the message. And that declaration is, bring on 2023. God bless you, everybody. I can't wait till I get to see you next week.